Good afternoon. Hello, everyone, and happy GIS Day. Welcome to another Directions Magazine webinar sponsored by ESRI. My name is Barbara Duke. I'm the executive webinar producer here at Directions Magazine and your moderator today. My colleague, Lynette Qualia, can also assist you with anything that you might have going on in terms of connections. Just connect with us on the GoToWebinar platform and we'll be able to assist you. A quick introduction to the many spatial things happening here at Directions Magazine. We hope to keep you informed of the latest trends and solutions with geospatial topics, newsletters, blogs, podcasts, industry channels, and of course our webinars. Fit us at us daily at directionsmag.com. We're thrilled to welcome folks from around the world, almost 800 global registrants joining us today. So like we said, we encourage you to ask questions. So you've got the control panel and a section called questions. Just click the plus to expand it and type your question anytime during the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can, but rest assured, the great team at ESRI and their friends today will do their best to follow up with you if we don't have time for your question. And the number one request is, are you recording? And indeed we are. You can review that on-demand version uh, following the webinar. Just give us a little bit of time. You, you can expect something in your inbox that gives you the link as well as all the pertinent online connections to make with our great panel. So let's meet these talented and wonderful folks. So our focus today is 3D transportation and infrastructure. <clears throat> we have an amazing panel um, with some great demonstrations for you today. We're going to re begin our presentation with Jeff Taylor. He's a 3D solutions engineer at Esri. Then Dave Burdick will then share and show off Lumen RT and LiveCube. And then we're going to see a great demonstration of what's been happening over in Alabama with a bridge project. J.D. Darville is going to show that off. And then Tom Tertio and Lai Taylor from Critigen are going to share their solutions as well. So we'll end with a few questions at the end. Uh, but gentlemen, welcome. And we are thrilled to have you today. Looking forward to seeing all these 3D solutions in these live demonstrations. Very exciting. Welcome. Thanks, Barbara. So let's begin uh, by covering some of the City Engine elements parts. Uh, today, I want to show you how you can leverage Esri City Engine to effectively conduct 3D transportation planning. And City Engine is a valuable tool for modeling initial design plans and can help anyone to quickly create and compare different design scenarios on the fly. This is something we call geodesign or geographic design here at Esri. And with City Engine, you can accomplish much more than just transportation planning. City Engine can also be used to create existing conditions for cities and environment models. There are several elements or data sets that can be leveraged to develop a convincing 3D model, and as you provide, provide you with all the necessary tools to convert your existing 2D GIS data and existing 3D models, such as iconic PLW Model Works buildings, shown here, into a smart 3D city model. Creating a smart 3D city model can be easily accomplished by leveraging two tools in the ArcGIS platform, known as ArcGIS Desktop and City Engine, and your 3D city modeling workflow. At the core of City Engine is a concept called procedural modeling, where users no longer have to manually model 3D cities and can design new scenarios by hand. Every 3D model can be generated on the fly using these procedural rules enabling anyone to rapidly build flexible design scenarios on the fly. All you need is 2D GIS data with attributes such as building footprints, parcels, street center lines, or tree points, and leveraging data attributes, these procedural rules will transform your 2D information into this smart 3D city model. City Engine is smart, and since the software was developed as geospatially data-centric with a procedural core, it allows for users to quickly visualize existing models and proposed designs via different mediums. These mediums could be realistic textured models or a thematic representation of that same model, showing zoning, some sustainable factors, or any other value that you want to portray. 
And since we can calculate information from every element of a procedural model, and even connect these models to other data sets, such as maybe soils or something else that you're using from your GIS data, those contain attributes, and we can generate performance reports and calculations such as cost, cut and fill, energy consumption, tree and parking counts, or anything else that you can benefit with reporting or using reporting in your design. Cities and AEC firms worldwide use City Engine to rapidly generate different design scenarios. And since the rules can be applied whenever you update or create a new design scenario, you remove the need to manually model features, which in return drastically decreases your typical design time frame. And when your design is complete, you can easily export the final model to another 3D modeling or rendering program back into a geodatabase for 3D analysis in ArcGIS Desktop to Luminar T, as you'll hear about here in a minute, or to a City Engine web scene. These City Engine web scenes can run directly on your browser without any plugins. Firefox, Chrome, you name it, you can even put them on your mobile devices. They're free, they can be embedded in your website as well, and they can be uploaded and shared internally or outside of your organization, as I'll show you in a little bit, on ArcGIS Online. So, I recommend that everyone goes to the Esri City Engine page, esri.com slash cityengine, and download a free version of the City Engine trial. And when you're there, you can go to the Redlands Redevelopment Rules here, under the Industries page, and you can download the rule set that we're actually using in this demo today. And within a few months, we'll be releasing new updates to the street rules, such as what you see here. So adding more complete streets functionality into the rules for more urban areas, but also more ways of modeling highways and infrastructural areas on the fly to help to cancel out the series of iterations uh, for different designs to get to the design you really want to have for the end product before you start to CAD things up. So let's begin by diving into City Engine. I want to show you a quick demo of how we can manipulate and work with streets inside of the software. So I can zoom in and I can select some elements of this bridge on the street network. This could be your existing GIS data you bring in, or like me, you could have just modeled uh, the streets on the fly. And I can move these elements up. There's a lot of tools you can use to manipulate these. And since we've applied what's called the procedural rule to these features, it automatically generates in 3D. So as we make things wider, they adapt too. So I'm going to move over to this area uh, just a little further over, select a couple of street networks here, and I'm going to change the street width. It's as easy as this. Drag the slider, make it about 14 meters wide, and it adapts to that width and gives you generic lanes to fit uh, that scale. You can choose between different parking styles, so you can add some parallel parking on both sides, generate that, and even add a bike lane very quickly. I'm going to select the street and regenerate it, and you see those uh, rules automatically apply. So we can also see reporting on this, but we'll wait till the web scene in a second to show that. I can then draw another street network, and it's going to adapt those initial settings that I placed on that first network. I can go and change those, change the size of that uh, street width, maybe down to nine instead. And since both of those parking spaces didn't adapt on the fly, you're going to have to make some more changes. So I'm going to turn off one of the parking uh, areas on the side and uh, just turn off both of them. So I can continue to uh, keep drawing streets. And I can completely enclose an area. And you could even use City Engine at this point for master planning. So you could visualize, okay, how would a new development look if we were to make these street improvements in this location? So drag a green space construction rule. That's how the procedural rules are applied, just that easy. And a building construction rule to those shapes. You could even import shapes from CAD, any other program, uh, several different uh, programs into City Engine and formats, and apply rules to those as well. So we can even change the building styles, we can modify the height, change the usage settings, and we'll get reporting on everything. And you'll see that in the web scene here in a second. So once I've applied the rule and have a master plan that I like or a proposal for a new area and I want to showcase this or share this with my colleagues on the web, I can just go down to File, Export Models, select City Engine Web Scene, choose a name, click Next, choose the layers in my model that I want to export, 
and click Finish. And it's going to create a packaged up web scene that can be loaded to the web and shared with my, your colleagues or the general public or whoever else you'd like to share this model with. You could even set bookmarks before you export this and you can navigate around in the web scene. And you'll see that here in a second, the final result of that, that is. So let's go down to the Rocky Mountain, North Carolina folder where this uh, actual web scene was saved. And I'm going to open this up, place it onto ArcGIS Online, add a few tags, you know, just like you would with traditional GIS data if you used ArcGIS Online to place things there. And then you can share this internally with your colleagues or externally to the general public. You can then view the application. And this is the final result that you can expect to achieve with these web scenes. So with web scenes, you can start to change a few parameters, such as conducting 3D analysis on the fly with sun and shadow assessments. You could also turn off and on layers. And if you wanted to, you could set up the scenes in a way where you could swipe between different design iterations. But in this case, we're just turning off and on trees or other features. So we're going to fly over near the structure that we just modeled a second ago and those new street improvements. And we'll show you something called commenting in 3D in a web scene. So you can interactively make decisions as a team as to what you like and don't like. So there, for instance, there's a reporting we discussed that you can visualize and it's exported to the web scene. So you see the cut and fill volume amounts. You see all of those key performance indicators if it's a lead building or even some cost estimates on other items. And then you can even add comments, such as the one you see here, uh, nice park space. So directly where you're looking, it adds a comment. And you can always go back and query those comments. And then to keep going, you can just click play on the browser where you've set the bookmarks. And it allows the user to navigate through these scenes. You can even set bookmarks in a way to where it looks like you're traveling across the ground in a car or at a little bit higher of an altitude giving you more flexibility to force users to see your design the way that you want it seen. So we've kind of covered web scenes and exporting from City Engine. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Dave Burdick from Yelp Software for him to showcase some of the awesome capabilities that their software can do coming out of City Engine. Thanks, Jeff. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank First of all, S3 and the good folks at Directions Magazine for putting this webinar together. I'm going to speak a little bit about Luminar 2 2015, which we just introduced two weeks ago. It's been very exciting as the product has really taken off due to all the new features and capabilities we've added, and I want to share with those with you today. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through how Eon and the good folks at LLFMATOT use Luminar T and Steve and other big Mobile River Bridge Project, which J.D. will talk about immediately following my presentation. Now, one of the really great things about City Engine, besides the terrific procedural modeling that Jeff Taylor just showed, is its fantastic ability to import and work with data from just about any CAD or GIS data source that you can think of. So here is uh, here we are inside of uh, uh, the City Engine. This is a screenshot taken from uh, City Engine uh, 2014, and we began the Mobile River Bridge project by bringing in a digital terrain model with some photo imagery here. You can see the terrain. And next we brought in a microstation model uh, directly from microstation. And along with this, we attached uh, a traffic animation, traffic simulation using microstation traffic, which I'll show you in just a moment. Next we brought in uh, streets and lots from a, a, a really fantastic facility called OpenStreetMaps. This is an open source uh, web uh, portal that allows you to actually uh, bring in shape data from virtually every major city in the United States and I think internationally as well. Now once we had these lots and shapes then we just used City Engine and the power of their procedural modeling to add some 
procedural rules to this in order to uh, build some of the intermediate uh, sort of mid-level detailed buildings and um, residential structures. For the more detailed models downtown, we actually uh, went to the SketchUp 3D warehouse and pulled in some SketchUp models. Now, you can pull in models not only from SketchUp, but from virtually any CAD system that you like directly into the city engine scene. So now we're, we're putting together a more complete scenario of the scene. And then next, um, using uh, points uh, from shapefile data, we actually modeled the trees and the trees uh, were, were generated using the Luminar T City Engine rule base that took each one of these points and applied uh, the trees directly on top of that. So you end up with something that looks like this. So you, you can see our highway here, uh, the bridge, uh, the buildings, the trees, and then now next is to take it from here and to bring it into Luminar T. So we just go into the City Engine interface and we now have the Luminar T export icon there, you just click next and it, it, and it transforms the scene from something that looks like this into something that looks like this. It takes around a minute to create the live cube. So this is a screenshot of the live cube here. Um, uh, this is the image of the Mobile River Bridge project. What I'd like to do now is to actually walk you through a live demonstration of the live cube. I'm going to do this through a video screen grab. I can assure you that everything you're seeing here is done in real time, but because of the bandwidth limitations, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, streaming this using a video. So here we are inside the Luminar T Live Cube. And you can, once you're inside of here, you can walk around and you can see the trees moving, the cars moving. You can create your own can animation, canned animation paths or walkthrough paths, or you can jump from one point of view to the next, just like you would in a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to zoom up here, and one of the things you can do is you can add and paint objects directly in the scene. So we have a content library of over 100 trees, several hundred vehicles and characters, and you can just brush these objects in directly. We can also add water. Here I'm going to add an ocean body, and we can zoom in. You can see it's a very nice looking water. We can adjust the direction and turbulence of the waves like so. We can also add objects. Any object that you can add can be animated, so I'm going to create a quick little animation path here using the animation path editor, and then you can play it, zoom in, you can see the sailboat in this case moving through the water. One of the nice things is that you can change the time of day. So we have a completely geo-referenced uh, time of day uh, system that you can change uh, from morning to evening. We can actually turn the day off and switch into nighttime, and we have, we've added lights here. So if you see here, there's a, a bunch of uh, lights we actually added in City Engine and brought those over. There's about 1,500 lights in the scene, and we've also used luminous materials to attach to the bridge structures and some of the detailed buildings. Um, we have a complete 3D atmosphere editor, so you can adjust things like cloud cover and haze. You can make uh, the weather clear or overcast. And you can generate some nice looking sunsets if you like. Luminar T 2015 comes complete with a, a terrain editor so you can bring in digital terrain uh, meshes or even height fields or if you want you can even sculpt your own terrains as you're seeing here so you can raise the terrain, you can lower the terrain, you can flatten it using the brush and then of course if you want you can take your eagle tool and paint in your objects in this case on painting is a whole row of trees here. One of the nice things we've added in Luminar T is the ability to uh, bring in layers so you can have layers uh, turn on and off so you can progressively display these in your presentations. If you want to get a little more fancy, we've added the ability to bring in section planes and these section planes can be animated as you're seeing here. So you can create really nice sort of cross through views of your scene. Okay, so that's some of the interactive capabilities. Let me take you now through uh, uh, a, a short little venue, video vignette of some video clips. So you can, inside of Luminar T, we have a complete video editor that allows you to create your own video clips. Here's showing what some of our clients have done with this. This is the Alabama DOT project that JD is going to take you through in more detail in a moment. It's a pretty sizable model, about the 
5 million polygons, 15,000 trees, 600 vehicles, and over 1,500 lights. So it's a, it's a fairly sizable uh, scene. Here's a model that shows uh, the new VizSim capability, uh, which I think is really uh, critical for you people in the DOT ranks. We now can bring in VizSim uh, simulations and animate those directly inside of LuminarT. Here's a large-scale model from South Carolina DOT from our good friends at Bentley Systems that shows a major highway intersection. This one has uh, over 800 vehicles and 30,000 trees, so it's a, it's a fairly sizable model. And that's it. <coughs> so let me jump back in here just to quickly summarize. So there's four key things uh, about Luminar T uh, that are the cornerstones of what we provide. Uh, first, we uh, provide the capability for surrounding your d designs with rich natural scenery. So Luminar T contains a complete content library with uh, over 100 plants and trees, uh, uh, 200 vehicles, and over 100 characters. We also can t have uh, skies and clouds and water that you can add in to, to create a really nice, rich natural environment surrounding your scenery. It's fully integrated with all the leading CAD, BIM, and GIS systems. So in addition to City Engine, we also have direct interfaces to MicroStation, uh, SketchUp, um, Revit, and new for Luminar T 2015, we've added uh, Graphisoft's ArchiCAD. Luminar T provides a very rich, realistic environment, near photoreal, and you can take these uh, live cubes and actually share them across the internet or create very nice images and videos with these. So in conclusion, uh, as I mentioned, we just introduced the product uh, two weeks ago, the, the 2015 version, um, and it's available. We have a new introductory offer uh, on this that's 25% off the list price. If you're interested, please visit luminart.com and you can download a version of the product to play with and take advantage of the special offer. So I'd like to now turn it over to J.D. Diarville, the visionary force behind the Mobile River, River Bridge project. Take it away, J.D. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, and again, I, I want to thank Esri and uh, Barbary for pulling this webinar together. Uh, it's been very informative so far, and I want to take you through the nuts and bolts of uh, trying to put a project together like this. It's, uh, it was a major undertaking. Uh, roughly a year ago, we were tasked with uh, this project, and going down there, one of the major causes, it's about an $850 million, million dollar project to start. Uh, we truly believe when it's finally built, it'll be a billion dollars. Uh, and the reason we're doing it, the problems of George C. Wallace Tunnel. Uh, it was opened in 1973, designed traffic volume of 16,000 vehicles a day, and right now they're pushing 67.5 through it. And that's on daily traffic. Uh, holidays, we're pushing somewhere around the, the number of 82,000, and traffic is backed up. I mean, backed up from miles. So, uh, and it's on a major interstate, Interstate 10. So we, we, we've got to do something. Uh, just an overview of the project, what you're seeing in the in the pink color there to the left is the actual bridge. Uh, the blue to the right of it is the bayway. Uh, and to close in on it a little bit more, it'll take off at Virginia Avenue, uh, come in just south of the George C. Wallace Tunnel, tie into the bayway there on Interstate 10, right down in between the bayway. Uh, very big project. Uh, you're talking about 215 foot of bridge clearance. Uh, to begin with, so we've got to get up and get back down in a hurry. That bridge is about two miles in length right now, uh, so 215 foot of clearance in the shipping channel, which is comparable to the Golden Gate, which I believe is about 220 foot. So uh, getting up and getting down in two miles to the height we're talking about is, is a major, uh, major action. Uh, this is just a rough mock-up. Real quickly, we, we actually the bridge was done in SketchUp to begin with. Uh, we took that bridge and brought it into MicroStation and uh, quickly exported some KMZ files and took these to the front office just to see if we were headed on the right path. Very preliminary, uh, just to give them an idea of what we were thinking about doing to show this bridge. Uh, here's where the fun part began, the LIDAR. We decided from an early get-go that we were going to shoot 10 square miles of aerial LIDAR, okay? So 
number one, that's a major undertaking in the time frame we were talking about. Uh, <clears throat> we took this LIDAR data right here. We superimposed the bridge. So we know that everything's geometrically correct when we got this data. But some of the keys to this were we had six weeks to set up this contract, set control, scan it, and receive the deliverables, you know, the pod files and LAS files. So not a lot of time there. I was actually out <clears throat> with John Russell from the location section setting control with him down there so we could get this project underway. So, uh, and the accuracy was one-tenth of a foot. So uh, we feel very confident that anything we're doing with this LIDAR uh, is very accurate. Uh, some of the ways we use the LIDAR, the USS Alabama was a point of contention down there. There's Battleship Park on the uh, <clears throat> west side of Mobile, uh, right off the Bayway. And they are very concerned about you know, when we put this bridge up that nobody's going to be able to see them, they won't get off the exit. And so one of the things we wanted to do was take this <clears throat> uh, data that we had and actually model this battleship with the scan. So I had some friends, uh, certainly 3D, and they helped us model this, the uh, battleship. And the reason we did that was so we can point, you know, we're going to take cameras, point them off the bridge, snapshots, animations, looking over there at that driving over the bridge. And, and, and we know for a fact that you can see that battleship. Uh, so it's not a problem. Uh, it was fun trying to get this battleship model. It's one of the toughest things we, we've attempted to do. Uh, real quickly, this is a, a standard model built in microstation and inroads. Uh, roadways are built in inroads. Uh, you know, we model some uh, different different features. Uh, one thing about a model like this, when, you, when you're considering doing an animation, it needs to be a tight model. Uh, there can't be any, uh, uh, in your transitions from a bridge to a roadway, there can't be any gaps in surfaces. Uh, uh, where you're tying into your existing surface, there can't be any gaps. Uh, because when you're doing an animation, that is tough to clean up. Uh, keep in mind the drive-through animation and fly-through animations that you'll see here shortly were uh, one was 8,000 frames and the other one was 6,000 frames. That's a lot of cleanup. Uh, so we focused on, on tying a real tight model together on our roadways and the existing surfaces. Uh, we even tried to pay, you know, we paid attention to detail. We modeled the flags of the battleship park, existing billboards that were out there. We took pictures of them and put them in here. We added F-4 Phantoms, B-52s, and even a submarine that's located at the park, uh, which is all back down in this area right there. But, uh, and then we rendered it in microstation. So everything you're going to see that up to the point of when uh, I was introduced today from, from Lumen RT was done in microstation and inroads, some Photoshop and Premiere to tie everything together. <clears throat> but you can see we're getting a pretty good view, a, a, a good view of what we're trying to do. Just another view looking back west, uh, City of Mobile. There's the flags I was talking about right there. You can barely see the F-4 Phantom in there, but uh, we even modeled the crane, the, the shipping cranes down at the, the port, uh, all the lights, the signage. So it takes time to put something like this together and do it right. And here's where we get into some photo matches. Uh, back in the day, I, I started doing visualization 18 years ago. Uh, and when you started doing photo matches back then, you had to do three to five points, uh, which makes it really tough to get a good photo match. You can get it, but it, it makes it tough. Plus, I was going out of microstation in the model view. The beauty of microstation right now is I can do it all within there. Uh, we're using SS3 microstation, by the way. And uh, so what I'm going to do right here is take to photo match this. We wanted to go ahead and put our bridge in there and also the LIDAR data itself. And you can look at a building. Even the striping on Interstate 10 right there, and it lines up perfectly with it. So we are very convinced that this bridge is very, very close to where it's going to sit. So I'm, I, I'm very comfortable going to court with something like this or public involvement meetings, which we've already done. And there it is, cleaned up, photo matched, rendered up. So put the shadows in there. Uh, we've got our traffic on there right now, uh, you know, still shot. <clears throat> and we went around, we went up in a helicopter at 600 foot, 1,500 foot, uh, took images. We took 450 images in 30 minutes in a helicopter. Uh, it was myself and Zach Cooper who was in, in the visualization group. 
and uh, nice cold day of about 30, 32 degrees. So when you get up in a helicopter with no no windows or doors, it's cold. But uh, turned out real nice. And here's one looking east. Again, we use the LiDAR data to photo match these. You can fine tune that model to every building you see if you want. And we did. We used the major structures and tied it in with those. And what you're looking at, right, we're looking south again, uh, just behind the RSA tower. That big tower right there, uh, it'll come into play a little later on. There's the bridge looking from the south. Uh, looking northwest, uh, there's great view right here with the city in the background. And you have to realize this project, too, uh, on the Mo Mobile is Mobile County. You've got Baldwin County that's right in the middle of the Bayway to the right. So uh, Mobile is a very historic area. Uh, there, there's a lot of concerns down there. We just had the EIS signed in uh, late, uh, uh, late summer and went to back-to-back -back public involvement meetings in late September. Uh, here's an image from Battleship Park. <clears throat> uh, I just I had to do this because I thought the B-52 looked great, and we wanted to see what the, uh, the uh, bridge would look behind it. So we actually used the LiDAR data to photo match this that, that included the B-52. So it uh, worked out real nice. Uh, that tower I was talking about, we got in that tower uh, later that night after the helicopter ride, or Zach did, uh, it's 750 foot up in the air. He's up in the superstructure of that tower uh, taking these pictures. Uh, one of the things we wanted to try and do was light this bridge up at night just to give the public an idea of what it would look like. A lot of people, when you go to public involvement meetings, they, they, they're they predetermined that it's going to be an eyesore. Um, so what we were trying to do is saying, hey, you know, this can be a showcase piece for the city. They light all the buildings up, so uh, we figured we could light the bridges up. And this is our first shot at it with a, a LED light. <clears throat> we attached the material down here, a mirror, so we could get the reflection off an, off an image. Um, then we came in and did LED blue. And I'm not sure if most people are aware, but uh, we did Mardi Gras, and that is because Mardi Gras was originally from Mobile, Alabama. So uh, we just wanted to light it up, so we looked at those. turned out great, and we got a major response to those uh, not only from the press, but from uh, uh, the public as well at the meetings. What you're going to look at here, this is an animation. Like I said, it's a combination uh, of a fly-through and a drive-through, all done in microstation, uh, 8,000 frames for the first one, which is, well, this is a fly-through. It was originally 6,000 frames. Uh, it took five days to render running 24-7 on five HP 820s that were built for a render farm, uh, $10,000 a piece boxes that uh, uh, did the job real nice. When we originally tried to do this on our original equipment, it was going to take 48 days running 24-7 to render. So, And this is all going to tie into how we hooked up with Dave in the end, and, and, and he made our life a lot easier because this is a great video. I love it. Very proud of it. Our group did a fantastic job on this, but in the end, it's canned. It's you know we're 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 going to drive down the road in a certain way, and we're going to fly around it in a certain way. So, but uh, you know, took a lot of time to get the traffic down and get it to work. It's again part of the fly through. Uh, you know, it's a canned image. So even when we were doing this, I was trying to think of how can I take it to the next level. And you can see the traffic moving across the bridge there. That's done in, in MicroStation 2. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it is we can't tie the actual numbers of our traffic by using this in, in that right now MicroStation. And you heard Dave earlier, that can be done. So those are things we were looking to do. This is driving across the bridge. The cable stays, shadows. Uh, you know, we've got people in the cars. Interesting side note, the first time I ran this animation, Believe it or not, I left the level off, and, the, and it was the people's clothes in the cars. So uh, we were traveling down the road with people in the cars with no clothes on, just to lighten it up a bit. So we had to go back and actually re rerun the whole animation to get it right. So uh, we're going to finalize this here shortly. The battleship will come into play, and you can see the signs we modeled. 
There's the F4 Phantom coming into play right there. Uh, the flags, the, the B-52 will be off to the left, and the battleship. So everything that you've seen right now, we went to a public involvement meeting with. But prior to that, about 30 days out, a good friend of mine, Kirk from uh, Washington, Kirk Stiles, he's got a fantastic vision group out there, by the way, uh, hooked me up with Dave from uh, Luminar T. And they did a presentation for us here at Aldot, and uh, I decided that it was something I wanted to do. So in a matter of 30 days, Dave and his group uh, got together with us, you know, in consultation, I don't know, maybe a couple times a week. We gave them our models, what we had. And in our original model, we had just the big, you know, the big structures from Mobile from SketchUp in there. Uh, and that's one of the things in the animation that you saw that, that, you know, it's a flat earth if you don't have anything up to project. And I wanted Dave to help us with that. So uh, he got his group together. And what I'm going to show you is some screenshots from the live queue. I will tell you this. This was the biggest hit at our public involvement meeting. I brought a workstation down. Uh, you can run it with a laptop if you got the proper graphics card. Uh, we brought a workstation down and a 46-inch monitor. And Zach Cooper and uh, Matt Taylor, that both worked for me in the Viz group at the time, uh, drove the live queue. We had a line of people there both nights. So it wasn't there the second night, but the first night, we had a line of people there. Major hit. Uh, we had the live queue going off to the left. I had the PowerPoint and the, uh, uh, our animation and the uh, uh, photo matches running in another room so people could come in and interact. And they'd actually, you know, they were asking questions and wanted to go to their place of residence or their business, and we could actually take them there and uh, show them what the project would look like. So, and here's some more of the uh, screenshots or screen captures from the live queue. Uh, I love the fact that you can take it, you know, time of day, uh, the clouds, like Dave said, the trees. If you actually get down on the trees, uh, the leaves are moving. You take them down on the water, uh, which we actually did. The, you know, the, uh, the, the water's moving around, the trees are moving. Uh, gives a very realistic view. And to have that capability to show the public is unbelievable. You know, in combination with the city engine and Luminar T and the models we built, our project couldn't have went any better. So uh, in closing, I do want to say this. There's some people that I do have to acknowledge from now that one is uh, Mr. Rex Bush, who is our assistant uh, chief engineer for pre-construction. He really went to bat for us to help us uh, get our foot in the front door of, of the office, front office, to, to show what we could do. Uh, Linda Sorrell was the engineering support administrator. Uh, my supervisor, actually, uh, really, went, uh, she let us go to work on this and, and, and uh, uh, show off what we could do. John Russell, our assistant location engineer, all the LIDAR data and all that, and he's the one that, that focused on that and got it to us in a timely manner. And Zach Cooper and Matt Taylor, who are both, uh, right now, they are the VIS group. Uh, I was promoted as of October 1, so I'm in the GIS section, but uh, those two did a phenomenal job on this. So uh, also Dave at Luminar T, Jeff and those guys at uh, uh, Critigen and Esri, uh, at, those guys did a fantastic job for us. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, and I think she's going to do a poll question, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, J.D. Uh, and we're going to get this switched over to Lai's screen real quick before we get into that poll question. But wow, what fantastic demos from everybody today. Um, so let's quick get your uh, input on if your organization is planning to create 3D models in-house. And I'm guessing that we've got a lot of 3D enthusiasts in the room and are excited about uh, getting these tools into use. So give everybody just a second or two to get those thoughts in. And thanks, everyone. So it looks like about 75% of you are on the yes. So thanks so much for participating. And Lai, Taylor, and Tom Tertio are going to join us um, and give us some great information about uh, the Critigen solutions. Lai, Tom? Well, 
Thank you, Barbary. Uh, this is Tom Tercio, CTO of Critigen. Uh, Critigen has a city engine practice and uh, we have a number of projects, one of which is a major London infrastructure project, and the other one is for a, a southeast uh, U.S. city. And I've asked Lai Taylor, who's the GIS senior analyst who's doing the work, we're doing that and other work for, for this particular city, to walk us through a city engine project. Before I do that, I just want to thank Directions Magazine and you, Barbary, as well as Esri and uh, Dave from Eon Software, Lumen RT, uh, for, for having us on the panel. So I'll hand it over to you, uh, Lai. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lai Taylor with Critigen. Uh, the project we're working on is the City of Decatur Art, Art District. It's an art, geodesign, and balance with nature project which uh, involves the City of Decatur in introducing uh, a new design for an art district in the historic center of the city. Um, the geodesign and, and suitability analysis was the first step in the process of site selection. Uh, the city itself had been an advocate for the arts and decided to just carve out a section of the city to be able to deploy a, an arts district. And so what they decided to do was utilize GIS and design principles with architects and planners to be able to come up with um, to be able to come up with a concept. And so the model they we developed, uh, worked on, uh, had a, a combination of different uh, different principles that then eventually led to an output, which is this um, this image that you're seeing, which is a suitability analysis using a weighted overlay. Uh, and then, of course, the systematic approach involved architects, planners, um, and the, their idea was to look at zoning ordinances as well as landscape features as well as infrastructure to be able to come up with a concept carefully weaving the art as well as the conceptual design into the historic district without creating an imbalance with the natural landscape. This is the resulting concept. The resulting concept was the utilization of City Engine and Luminarity, uh, developing a model that if you look at the image on the left, it actually looks without the uh, a mural wall and a building structure on the left. Um, it did produce uh, the end result was a, concept, a series of models that we could actually generate in City Engine and using the Luminar T tree library. In essence, this was the concept behind um, what we're doing for the city of Decatur, and we are producing additional scenes for them to present at a public hearing as well as the city commission meeting. And this is the extent of the project, and additional work will be done as, the, as time progresses. I'll hand it over now to Tom to actually finish with the last slide. All right. Thank you very much, Lai. So I just wanted to quickly go through the uh, Critigen City Engine Jumpstart. It's a five-day uh, package, easy to consume. We look at the needs assessment. We identify the three use cases where a city engine can be brought to bear. And, uh, and then we look at how the Lumen RT live cubes can can give you immersive 3D for your scenes, as you've seen in the rest of the presentation. And you can see the URL below, which I believe is available, I think, in the slides. Uh, and, and you can get at it after. So I'm just simply going to hand it back to Barbary for questions. And thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we're going to give Jeff one more shot at uh, wrapping things up for us. And then we're excited to take your questions. So folks, do take the time to go ahead and type those in, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Thanks. Jeff? So on behalf of Esri and everyone else, I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar before the questions. Um, if you'd like to know more about uh, City Engine, please visit esri.com slash City Engine. I'd also like to thank our friend David Burdick from Eon Software. They have a great tool called LuminRT that I've worked with quite a bit on some projects. It's very easy to go from City Engine into that product and back and forth, as well as with your other 3D programs. Go to LuminRT.com to learn more about that. JD, an amazing job with the uh, project on the Mobile River Bridge. It's going to be a lot of cool projects that we're going to see coming out of Alabama with these workflows in the future. Uh, please visit the MobileRiverBridge.com website. If you'd like to learn more about that project, and I'm just amazed every time I go back to that website, um, just the amount of work that they were able to do in a short amount of time for that project. And if you want to learn more about uh, Critigen's 
3D Jumpstart that they offer um, that Tom was talking about earlier, uh, please visit critogen.com slash solution slash 3D visualization. Again, thanks everyone, and let's uh, dive into some questions. Fantastic. So <clears throat> let's start with the City Engine stuff, Jeff. Uh, what types of data can they bring into City Engine? Man, there's a lot of different kinds. Uh, <laughs> two 3D formats that you can easily bring in are object.obj or Collada, which is a .dae. Um, the .dae typically holds some of your spatial information, and that's one of the easier approaches to take it in. Sit Engine also exports a lot of different uh, 3D formats, and there's a professional and a basic version, basically an advanced and a, a basic version of City Engine that allow you to export that way. But you can also use Python scripting to do some importing and exporting as well uh, with the product. We also take in CAD files in DXF format. We take in shape files and geodatabases, rasters and TIFF format, um, and JPEG format as well. So there's a lot of things back and forth. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to the esri.com slash city engine page. We have a help page that kind of talks through all that information, or just download a copy of City Engine and uh, open it up and you can kind of see and work with some of your existing formats you already have. Okay, great. So to piggyback on that, are there any standard design settings to help constrain the modeling to reality? Um, in, in relation to that, what, in what context uh, design settings? They haven't been specific, but... Uh... So um, once you have your data, that early on that's a in the day. shape file or a, uh, let's say it's a, a GIS data set, you can bring in line files that are street networks, you can bring in 3D geometries that already exist. Any of these geometries, you can apply procedural rules to them and they'll do something. For instance, a 3D building, you can place solar panels on the roof. Or for instance, a, um, a street that's already modeled in 3D, you can have it do something to the top of that 3D model. But if it's a 2D network, City Engine will create that into a street network with widths for your street width, and then also give you the ability to change your sidewalk widths. And you can drag and drop rules and even customize any of these City Engine rules. You can write your own rules, customize them for your workflow, however you guys want to approach that. Um, and everything's just drag and drop once you have those rules developed, or use our existing rules on the City Engine resource page. And how does City Engine integrate with Arc Desktop? So City Engine, in my opinion, is actually fully integrated with ArcGIS Desktop if you know how to trans transfer data back and forth in certain formats. Uh, I recommend staying within the geodatabase. Um, don't use shapefiles if possible because it retains all of your characters. You have a 12-character limit on some of your data. Um, and with that, you can use the rules to connect to those GIS data attributes coming out of ArcGIS. You can clip your data. You can process your data in, Ar in ArcGIS Desktop. Your raster images, you can process those into a TIFF or a JPEG so they can go into City Engine. And then that's optimized to go into game engines or third-party products um, as well, uh, or rendering solutions uh, once it's in City Engine. Cool. So, uh, Dave, we've got a question for you. Uh, when will the Lumen RT 2015 trial be available for download? That's a good question. Uh, should be up in the next week or so, and we'll uh, have files of all the versions of the product, LumenRT GeoDesign and LumenRT Studio. So check the website. Should be up sometime uh, next week or so. Awesome. And JD, we've got one for you. Uh, have you used any UAS for imagery capture at any point? I have not. We have not used that. So uh, strictly all my images are coming from, from the location section, anything I'm using there. So uh, now that I'm in the GIS section, we're looking at some other capabilities downstairs. So uh, that could be a possibility. Excellent. So another one for you, um, were there and I, I think that you touched on this briefly, but maybe you can be more specific or give us a little more detail. Were there any real-time changes made to the models as designs were being discussed with the public or the stakeholders? No, we did not. We, we the live cube, and like I said, all my stuff prior to Dave getting involved, you know, were canned animations, the photo matches, uh, and renderings. That, we just ran that on PowerPoint. The live cube, at the time, we don't. I think we've got the capability in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. This was all done in 2014, so uh, those are things we could look at in the future. But I will say this: we will continue to use Lumen RT City Engine. Uh, I'm just about to get my copies of, of City Engine and the new Lumen RT, so 
uh, we're going to proceed. It's fantastic software, and it, it, the realism that it gives to the public, uh, when you're trying to sell something to a stakeholder, uh, it, it needs to be as real as it can. And it gave us the opportunity to do that. And um, I won't lie to you, even one of the TV stations down there uh, was talking about how professional it looked and wanted to know what studio did it for us. Well, that's high praise. Uh, so, Dave, a question back for you. Maybe you could give us a little more detail on the difference between LuminRT and Eon um, rendering packages. So, yeah, so we have um, two sort of lines of business. Um, one of them is our view uh, business, which is a um, ray tracing product that's used primarily in the movie industry. If you saw the movie Avatar, all of the vegetation and skies and environment rendering was done in the view package. But that's a ray tracing project product that's primarily used uh, in the movie and entertainment business. LuminRT does the same thing except in the engineering and GIS space, but it's all real time. That's the major difference. So um, uh, all, all of the environment that you create, the trees, the skies, the water, the people, the vehicles, you're all you don't have to sit there and wait for something like JD was talking about, putting it up on a render farm and rendering it up, you know, for you know for a week to get the results. You get the results immediately, and that allows you to interactively walk through the live cube um, and perform all of your visualizations directly that way. You can also, you know, then create your own walkthroughs, and if you want, of course, you can generate videos directly out of that. But uh, the, the, the fundamental foundation of the technologies that we use here at Eon Software, our plant technology, our atmospheres technology, our water technology, our lighting, uh, is all shared between both the VIEW product and the LuminRT product line. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Jeff, back to you. Is there online training available for City Engine? Yes, so we have several resources out there. Um, the first one that I'd recommend off the bat is if you want to learn something quick, Go to Google and search for City Engine TV, one word or two words. Uh, it'll take you to the YouTube uh, page where you have a lot of pre-recorded training for City Engine. Also on the Esri training page for our software, typical software training, um, there are a few courses that you can take, and there's a couple that you can pay for there to learn more about those. I think they're only like $30 a piece, worst case, for that training. Um, with the Revlins Redevelopment uh, page that's on the City Engine uh, main website under Industries, uh, with those street rules, we actually have a training package there you can click on and it shows you how to use those street rules and how to build new developments in 3D. And then there's all sorts of other training on the City Engine resource page. Um, just You can just search for that online, City Engine resources, and it'll take you straight to a page where there's a lot of uh, different tutorials and training um, that are at your disposal to work through. Fantastic. Well, folks, uh we know that we've got other questions out there, and we are certainly running out of time. So uh, if you've got a last-minute thought, do go ahead and type that in. We are collecting those. We'll be sure that they get to the right folks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending today. As a reminder, you're getting a copy of today's webinar archived and uh, on an email link for on-demand. We'll also appreciate you completing the very brief survey that pops up on your way out. Hope that you'll join us again on December 2nd for the next Directions webinar. Thanks again to Esri for sponsoring today's webinar. Jeff, Woody Hines, who's been behind the scenes the whole time hanging out with us over there at Esri. Dave, JD, Tom, Lai for sharing their expertise. Just go have a great day and be sure and tell a friend about Directions Magazine. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>